Okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight to the Mason District Council's State of Our Schools Forum. Uh, my name is Molly Leffler, and I'm the chair of the Mason District Council, and we are very pleased to host this important community event. Uh, the Mason District Council is a volunteer nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan organization made up of homeowner associations and civic associations in the Mason District. Our volunteers work with Fairfax Federation um, to give community, the community a voice on issues of importance. Um, and for our meeting schedule, you can go to masondistrict.org and check out our website. Our next meeting is March 19th, which will be on um, neighborhood safety with uh, the commander of the Mason District Station. I want to thank all of our member associations for um, helping with this event. And I want to just give a couple shout outs to our board. Um, and if you want to applaud them, you sure, sure can. Uh, first of all, let me thank Debbie Smith, our vice chair from Ravenwood. Our secretary, Carol Turner from Ravenwood Park. Our treasurer, John Clark, guru of sound and um, camera. And um, Sid Kalaji, who is helping us this evening from Broyville Press, Sound Tech Extraordinary. Can you hear me okay, everybody? Okay. Um, we want to uh, give a special thanks to Sandy Evans, our school board representative, for helping to organize this event. Jill Barris, president of Glasgow PTA, for being so helpful to this event. All the other PTAs and um, hardworking PTA uh, volunteers who helped, and community leaders that helped spread the word on uh, this, and um, educators. Tonight, the main themes we'll talk about will be um, overcrowding, funding and proffers, accreditation, and residential development. Other things may come up, but those are the topics that we're going to be focusing on with the panel. Um, and we're going to open up with the folks on the panel um, introducing themselves, and then MDC will have some questions, and then after that, audience, the audience will um, get to ask whatever questions you have. So I would like to ask Dr. Garza to give us an example of the you're, you've been talking too long, Bell. <laughs> Thank you. So if somebody talks too long, they will get the bell, um, and I haven't told that yet. So she's not in charge of the bell. Um, Carol is in charge of the bell, so do not, you know, and the paddle, the warning paddle, okay? All right. So, um, <laughs> I know, okay? Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to our uh, school board representative, Sandy Evans, and she's going to introduce and say welcome, and then the panel will introduce. Thank you so much, Molly. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight for this very important discussion. And I particularly want to thank Molly Leffler and Debbie Smith and Carol Turner. Let's give them a round of applause again for their wonderful work and Government Research Council. Uh, we are delighted to have such a wonderful panel here tonight. Um, Dr. Garza is here, uh, Dr. Karen Garza, our superintendent. We have Assistant Superintendent Jeff Plattenberg of Facilities and Transportation. We have Region 2 Assistant Superintendent Fabio Zuluaga, who's here tonight. And on my left, we have A.J. Ruat, who's coordinator for Facilities Services Planning. Uh, we have Jeff, uh, or, sorry, Jay Pearson, who is Executive Principal for Region 2, and uh, Terry Day, who is Executive Principal for um, School Improvement, also for Region 2. So we have some uh, wonderful people here tonight to answer questions and to have a discussion. Ter uh, our chair, our school board chair, will be here any moment. Unfortunately, uh, the wrong school was put on her calendar. So she is racing over here from Sleepy Hollow Elementary, but uh, Tammy Darren and Kovacs will be here any minute. I also want to recognize my colleague, my school board colleague, Patty Reed, if you would stand up, please. She is the Providence District next door. 
I also see um, a number of principals and would uh, would and assistant principals. Would our principals and assistant principals please stand up and be recognized? Thank you so much for being here tonight and for being part of this conversation. Um, we have a lot of issues to discuss, so I'm, I'm not going to start this off with any kind of a speech other than to say welcome and that I look forward to this conversation. Um, thank you very much, and I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Garza to say whatever kind of introductory remarks she may have. Dr. Garza. Thank you very much. First of all, I have to say I'm very impressed with the turnout tonight, uh, but I'm not surprised. Uh, I know this community is very passionate and very supportive of the schools. And I think you're a key reason why uh, we can be so proud of our schools. And I know the principals, assistant principals will recognize Penny Gross, thank you for hosting tonight here at, at uh, Glasgow Middle School. <laughs> and I, I know that we have some other faculty, staff that are in the room uh, from Fairfax County Public Schools. If you're a part of our wonderful team, if you would stand up so we can acknowledge uh, you more quickly. We have a lot of people that I think are We, uh, we are grateful for the supportive community that our schools um, enjoy here in our, in our community. Um, and that cannot be said in every community throughout the United States. So we're really, really fortunate. Um, and like I said before, uh, all of these factors together make great schools. Um, do we have challenges? No doubt we're going to talk about some of those challenges ahead. Uh, and we think that working together we can find uh, I don't think there's any school system across the country that's better poised and situated to come up with these solutions that we need to really move our school system forward. And we're going to need everyone working together because we have some uh, significant challenges that we're going to talk about with regard to capacity, uh, certainly school improvement. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, one of the many things that we've accomplished, I think, we've been busy, I think, haven't we, uh, Ms. Evans, uh, over this last year and a half. A reorganization, uh, which included Dr. Uh, Dr. Zulaga, uh, who now is the assistant superintendent over Region 2, along with our new executive principal model, because the real focus for us is how do we get more on the ground support to our schools. And I will tell you that I'm already hearing that it's making a very positive difference uh, to have that kind of level of support. So we're grateful uh, for that. Um, we also have a couple of folks I'd like to real quickly introduce on FPAC. Uh, that's our Facilities Planning Advisory Committee. It's a large uh, committee of uh, individuals that are appointed by our school board. Uh, Dan, now Ms. Amanov, Amanov, I knew I was going to do that wrong, and Charlie Goodman, that are here tonight. Um, and I'll tell you that I'm amazed and impressed at how many hours we're putting into this work. And we're just really beginning in, in significant earnest around how do we look to the future with our uh, significant challenges. I kind of laughed last night. We had a meeting that went pretty late last night, and I kind of laughed. We may have to put you on payroll. You're putting so many hours into this. But no, seriously, though, we do, do appreciate how much uh, time and how important it is for us to have the pulse of the community to make these very important and strategic uh, decisions. I had some other things I'm going to talk about, but I think I'll um, leave it to the questions. I want to make sure that everyone has time to ask the questions that you have on your mind, uh, but I'll just leave you with this. We have great people all throughout our organization and we're committed to working very closely with you in the year, in the days, the weeks, the months, and the years ahead to do continue to do great things for our children in this community. Uh, we're here to serve you and your children and your family. So thank you for having us here tonight. Okay, so thank you so much. And I guess we didn't really have anyone introduce themselves. If you guys want to, I think we're, Sandy pretty much made the introduction, so that's right. Okay, so welcome again if you just, anybody who just came in. I did want to clarify that we do have two Penny Grosses, and I don't think anyone else can claim this, but yeah, so we have Penny Gross, our principal at Glasgow, and our supervisor, Penny Gross, who will be here shortly. Um, she had a conflict with a scheduling conflict, but she's also planning to come. Yes. And Tammy Darren at Coffax is here. Thank you for coming. What school did you get to go to? We heard they sent you to the room. Yeah, I went to Sleepy Hollow. Luckily, it was, it was close. Sleepy Hollow. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Let me just put our, our slide up here. So the first question is regarding um, the uh, overcrowding and the capacity issues. And we kind of um, we have a map here that shows visually which schools are over capacity. But the first question was, um, what is the plan to, do, to address the capacity issues at the schools that are currently over capacity at all three levels? And I will turn that over to whoever wants to take the question. Just get the mic on your table. Yeah, I can go ahead and start with it if anybody wants to chime in again. Well, we certainly have a challenging condition. There's no doubt about it. I mean, when you look at the, uh, one of the things that we had out this season is the actual excerpts from the latest CIP document, the Capital Improvement Program. Um, not unlike many other regions, we have significant problems, but I know that we're here to talk about this region. Uh, we've been addressing problems that we've been having in this region, and the biggest problem that we had as of late was Bailey's Elementary School. It was a project that was seven years trying to find a resolution and a solution to really untenable situation, especially for the teaching and learning that goes on in, in our buildings. Um, when you look at the CIP, you look at what we currently have, in this region, we still have, it's a healthy thing to have growth. That's a sign of a vibrant community. However, with that growth, it's, it's not fraught without problems. And the problems that we've seen, um, uh, I'll, I'll have a little aside, um, that we've been addressing, is looking at how we can find seeds. Now, the difficulty is, not only with this region, but with others, is that a lot of times where we find seeds is not in the areas where we have capacity challenge. So when you look at the CIP, when you look at the outlook, I think this was, I don't know the period of time that this covers. This from the most recent. Yeah, this is from the yeah, current no, CIP. I didn't know if it was for the outlook projections for the five year CIP. Do you so, know that, Debbie, our fact lady? Right, right. Okay. So what happens is in the CIP process, we do an annual revision of a five-year look at what the forecast is. And within that, as you delve further about, I know there's an introduction of the FPAC members, working together, we've started to identify possible solutions, right? Now, these are recommended options. They're not the option. They're recommended options to get conversations to begin in communities. It's to identify possible solutions for the forecasting overcrowding conditions. Now I will say one of the things that we have seen, just a little historical perspective, that where can we have forecast the greatest growth in this region is one of them, but there's also other regions. The greatest growth in the regions, we've also shown that our actuals have come in less than what our projections have been. Now that's a good thing in this situation. However, it doesn't alleviate the reality. The reality of what you're looking at on the screen behind me. But what you have and what was handed out, what was provided up at the front, was a copy or an excerpt out of that CIP document. It's the one that starts with the map. It looks oddly familiar to the one up on the screen, um, but it doesn't have the percentages that were, were well put in there. And within that, it identifies the possible solution that the uh, planning staff and working with individual school board members and magisterial district came up with possible options for consideration. Now, it generally talks about an individual time frame. And without going into the, the, the details of each individual school, um, I'm going to open it up because I think I'm probably going to get dinged at some point. But I'm going to open it up for more conversation. But within that construct, within that document, you'll find possible recommendations for each of those possible solutions. And I'm sure we're going to get into a lot more than that time frame. Well, I was just going to mention a couple of specific situations because I, I know that there are people here uh, particularly interested in Stewart High School and in Glasgow as well. Um, at Stewart High School, if you look at the solutions there, um, and they may not be fleshed out, we're looking at a couple of things. For the immediate future, what we're looking at is recapturing space inside the building, and facility staff have been over there looking at ways to uh, reconfigure space inside the building. The other solution that we're looking at is the possibility of putting an addition on that school. 
and uh, the, the most recent idea was to put a third floor on part of that school. Now that would require the help of the, of the county. We would need to rezone, but the, those are the two things that we're looking at there. At Glasgow, this school is at capacity now, soon to be over capacity. We do have physical room outside. Uh, many of us in this room remember the days when we had to fight to get Glasgow built out to this level, to this number. Uh, we were told at one point it will never be full. It is now full, and this is only a few years later. So that shows you something about the growth in our area. Sandy, uh, sorry, I just have to say that um, there is a gray SUV blocking a bus. Here. Am I right? And out front here? Out back. Anyone here? Gray SUV. Of course, everyone's driving a gray SUV. <laughs> Did we get a license plate? <laughs> in the bus lot. Are you in the bus lot and you have a gray SUV? You may want to think about that. Thank you. Back to Sandy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I won't be too much. I'm just going to mention a couple of things. Bailey's was a crisis situation, which we now have created with uh, the help of a lot of people, a lot of coordination. We have created Bailey's Upper Elementary School, our first vertical building in Fairfax County. And we're very proud of that facility. And I, um, I hear from parents all the time that uh, they are very, very happy. I know we have some Bailey's Elementary School parents here with us tonight. It's a tribute to our wonderful facilities folks that they were able to um, get that up and running uh, in, in, in a year's time. Our next, if you can, if you look at Glen Forest Elementary, you'll see that that's another um, very difficult situation. Uh, boundary issues, the boundary study is not really going to work there because we are right up against uh, the, the edge of our county there. Where, you know, if you, if Arlington County wanted to take a few kids, maybe that would happen. But they're not going to do that. So, uh, Glen Forest, we are looking at the possibility of are we going to build at that school? Would we continue to increase capacity there? It's already a school that's over a thousand children, and it's expected to grow to be over 1,300 children in the space of five years. We need to do something for that school. We could uh, continue to build on, but that would create a very large elementary school. Another possibility would be to get another school in this area. We have been having conversations with the county about the possibility of co combining on the, Wils the old Wilston School site, and I think that will come up in conversation later today as well. We've been having some conversations about the possibility of looking at property over on Columbia Pike. Uh, that's, an, uh, again, an active conversation. We have not been on a solution for that school, though. But we are going to continue to uh, look for different solutions and um, an option for that school. <coughs> okay. Now remember that that you audience, um, we did have little note cards at the front, and you will have a chance to ask questions once we open it to the floor. But we're going to get all of our questions out and then open it to the mics on each side of the room. Um, okay. So that was. Um, any uh, anyone else have it? Okay, number. Can you put that other agenda up for me? Go on. Okay. Um, okay. So the accreditation question. Uh, accreditation is a serious issue, and the Stewart community is very concerned. Um, and it is has been accredited with warning for the past two years. Um, what is what would happen if they lose this accreditation status. Yeah, anybody can come out in front right. again. Hi, uh, good evening. I'm Fabio Zuluaga. I am uh, the Region 2 Assistant Superintendent. This is a new region for me. I am not new in Fairfax. I was the close to eight Assistant Superintendent for five years. And now I have the honor of leading and supporting our principals in this wonderful region where we enroll close to 40,000 kids. And before I respond in terms of the things that we are doing to support the accreditation and the movement of uh, student achievement in Region 2, I just want to point something that really is calling my attention. Look at this sign right there in Spanish that says, Los que tienen más, quieren más. That means the ones who have more, they want more. Very appropriate for uh, 
they sell it here in the, cafe, in the cafeteria, no? If you want more, if you have more, you usually end up with wanting more. Uh, accreditation, uh, in Virginia, you have to have uh, the index in order to be accredited. You have to have, have 85 percent of your students have to graduate on time. Uh, this past year, Stuart High achieved a graduation rate of 84 percent. So we missed that uh, benchmark for uh, one point. We are determined to achieve the 85 percent uh, benchmark this year. We have put some really solid structures in place between uh, 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 Jay, Terry, and myself. We have visited uh, the schools, probably close to 300. We have conducted 300 visits, uh, coaching and mentoring our principals, because the graduation rate is just not a high school issue. The graduation rate is a K through 12 issue that we are addressing in terms of how we promote student achievement, especially in, in, in reading and mathematics. And with that in mind, this year we really have identified all the students at Stuart High that um, uh, are at risk of not graduating on time. Uh, we are providing after school support to those students uh, three times a week. We are providing um, tutoring and mentoring classes, especially in mathematics, uh, on uh, Saturdays. And the reality is that the vast majority of our kids who are struggling in terms of, in order to graduate on time, are the students that are not fluent in English. Uh, some of them are uh, uh, recent immigrants. Uh, they have been in the country probably three years. But if, still, as a former um, English language learner myself, in order to be able to um, achieve um, or master or accomplish the benchmark in subjects such as Algebra 1, Algebra Geometry, Algebra 2, you do have to have a, a strong uh, command of the English language. Our students are moving in that direction, but uh, they are the ones who are struggling right now, so we are providing a lot of uh, support in uh, literacy, in reading, writing, and in mathematics to be able to uh, 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 reach that particular benchmark. We are uh, determined with the support of our principal, uh, uh, Stuart Hyde. We also with the wonderful support from our team, uh, the administrators. We meet almost every week to see how, what kind of progress the students are making uh, because uh, we just kind of uh, continue to move the student achievement forward. Uh, okay, so what, what happens if they don't get the accreditation though? If you go and the visit, end. that's a great question in the end. What really? happens to the school? Does it get, what happens? Yes, we went, actually, Mrs. Evans and I, we went and visited the uh, Virginia Department of Education, and what are the consequences if you don't, uh, if you uh, grab, if, if the school loses the accreditation? And uh, the Virginia Department of Education pretty much says that they don't, they, yes, we, they, they, we will have more oversight from them, but at the end, they don't even have clearly spelled out what would be the consequences. Because the students do not graduate from a, from a store. Students would graduate from Fairfax. And it, remember, uh, Sandy, I don't know if you want to make a comment because you and I read the, uh, the information from the Virginia Department of Education. The reality is that we clearly we will have probably more guidance and more support and more oversight from the Virginia Department of Education. But in terms of other consequences, I don't... Yeah. Sure. Um, sorry. What, what are you... <laughs> what are you doing? Um, what are you doing? Um, we're working very closely with the uh, Virginia Department of Education. We just had a conference call with Dr. Steve Staples and his team actually was a teleconference last Friday. Because not only are we concerned about you know, one, one cell of data being the determining factor for accreditation ratings, which we believe is a flawed approach. We're also concerned about the elimination of some of these tests. Uh, you remember you probably read about they reduced some of the testing. By pulling some of those out, they may have a serious effect on accountability ratings. So they're really working with us uh, to make sure that this year that there is some flexibility built in. So, they will not be taking over our school or anything like that. I'm confident we'll get there. And, and one more thing I'll have to tell you, I do think it makes a difference having a lot more on the ground support. 
Um, we have, of course, Dr. Zalaga, who's one of our best assistant superintendents. Uh, we have an award-winning high school principal that we hired to help us with this. You may also not all know Jay Pierce, award-winning high school principal at Marshall High School. We knew we needed a lot of high school expertise and support. And he and Terry, Terry Day, who again is also a rock star principal, have really been helping us provide support to our schools. One last thing I would have to say is this. We recognize that we've experienced a unique phenomenon this year and a significant number of students entering our system who are level one English language learners. It's been very unique. And, and I, I believe it's posed, in my estimation, significant challenges for our schools, particularly our secondary schools, at the middle school level and the high school. We have engaged a team, uh, and in fact, some of your, your uh, faculty and staff have been involved. We intend to be in a position this next school year to start a very specialized program, school within a school, to provide for the unique needs of a student entering high school who does not speak English. Uh, it's really difficult, and those of you that uh, are in state close to Stewart High School and even here at Glasgow, um, Glasgow Middle School, is it's difficult. And so we recognize that we have to have a new and different instructional model and potentially some additional adult education that looks different. So we're working on that intensely. We're on an accelerated timeline. The principals and their teams have been very involved, and we expect to be in a position to do that next fall. So we recognize that's part of the solution. Thank you so much, and I want to say that I really welcome this uh, new innovative program that we're going to be, be starting in the fall. I, I wanted to, to add one thing. I know that there was some concern among parents. First of all, I, I agree. I'm very confident that we uh, will uh, have accreditation, so I don't think that's going to be an issue. However, it was a basic question, well, what about the IB diploma? What about uh, my child's uh, diploma in graduation? That does not affect any child, so uh, regardless, the children still graduate uh, with a with a, an IB diploma. They have a, a full IB, and that's not diluted in any way. But um, again, I, I'm confident that we won't even be at that point. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to skip to number five, um, and I'm going to ask you to put the that space. Oh, I guess I should read the question first. <laughs> Please skip back one slide. Um, okay, this actually I had to show you guys this. This is the residential um, percentage that they're they're talking about for Sears, and we've um, it's 80% residential compared to some of the other areas that are closer to Metro. Um, now this isn't the final number for Sears, but this is some of the discussions that the neighborhood working group has um, been working on. I just want to show you that that's a lot of residential coming our way, and um, then we'll skip to the next slide um, back backwards, please from there. Uh, this is actually upcoming development. So you see there's going to be 5,210 units at least in the Seven Corners Task Force recommendations. That would be over near Wilson Center, Patrick Henry, um, and uh, that area. Then the Bailey's Crossroads Comprehensive Plan Amendment. That's uh, near Trader Joe's. That would be, or is that, that Trader Joe's area? The whole Bailey's area, that's nearly 9,000 units. Those are just kind of um, figures that they're saying they're allowed to build to. Below there is the actual things that are going in. So Sears is still in discussion. 6406 Arlington Boulevard, that's the Twin Towers over there by Route 50. That's already going in, 174 apartments and 14 townhouses, that's in, going in. Southeast Quadrant, um, that was just approved. That's gonna be 250. 270 apartments. That one is over Riley Acura off Columbia Pike. I believe that feeds into our friends at Glen Forest and Park Lawn. I don't know. Sandy probably would know that. But um, Roslyn Auto Body, again, that's your Park Lawn, Bailey's, or a lot of us at Park Lawn, um, probably maybe that Columbia Pike. That's going in 77 townhomes. 5600 Columbia Pike, um, that is over there at the intersection of Carlin Springs and Columbia Pike. And, oops, I've got the bell. 433 apartments. Anyway, you get the idea. So that's why I think we one of the impetus to have this forum was because of the development um, that's coming. Here's the, the question is, um, can you put the question up for me? Um, are these, um, when residential development proposals are made in areas where schools are over capacity, can developer proffers be raised from 11,300 per student or can the school board 
vote to not approve any new development proposal? This is the question. Well, first of all, with proffers, we are having this conversation at the board level and with our staff and with the county staff. We just had a work session in which we looked at the student yield ratio and the, uh, the proper formula. Um, I think uh, and our FPAC members as well said that this $11,000 should be about double. Um, and of course, $11,000 does not pay in Fairfax County for one year for one child. So um, my own sense is that yes, we would certainly, the school system would certainly like to get that number up much higher. To, um, to pay for the children. Um, at the Sears site, um, remember that we also asked for another meeting to join the budget development, right? Not the, the, the infrastructure finance committee. Right. And we have asked to, that's right, thank you, Dr. Garza. We have asked that to, that is a joint committee, and I, was, I served on the uh, that committee along with Mrs. Reed and um, <coughs> Kathy Smith on the school board along with with three members of the Board of Supervisors. We did make some progress as far as the budget. We would like to make more. We feel that, that this is a topic of conversation that we should continue to have with uh, the county board as well. So we're, and specifically on proper, specifically, um, and, and the student load ratio is something that we're also having a conversation about. I raised at the work session the idea, could we ask for a bonus proper in areas where a school is over capacity, and I'll take the Sears site as an example. The Sears site, any development that goes in there, the students there will go to Sleepy Hollow Elementary School. So that's in the Sleepy Hollow catchment area as well as Glasgow and Stewart. And Sleepy Hollow is at capacity, Glasgow's at capacity, Stewart's at capacity. So I think that's a good example, and I'll, I'll say um, I've been following the Sears development um, throughout the, that process, of course, and I can take my school board member hat off for a moment and say as a neighbor, I'm concerned um, about uh, too much development there. As a school board member, I'm concerned about putting on a large number of children in schools that are already at or over capacity. Right, the point was we don't have approval authority over any of the developments. One of the things, no. What, one of the things I want to add is on pages four, five, and six of the document that I mentioned that's available there, it does address and talks to student yield data. It also speaks to the proper aspect. Now there's a little bit of a, it can be a, get a little salty and a little chewy when you get into it, but what really happened is if there was a motion by the school, by the Board of Supervisors in 2002 that really acknowledged the need to start providing these types of things for the school district. That was a very progressive movement where a number of people, both with the school board and the planning commission and the county board of supervisors, worked together to come up with some way that the school system could benefit. So the feeling and belief is that that was great for the time. We need to have that conversation again. The school board has directed staff to go ahead and start working with staff, both with the county board of supervisors and also the correspondence that will be being sent over to re-engage the infrastructure finance committee that purpose. Okay. The only thing I'll say is pages four, five, and six really go to the delineation of it. It talks about the student yield, the accuracy of the student yield. It also talks about the proper contribution and um, each of those benchmarks because when you look at what is planned, what actually occurs as has been evidenced by those of you who have been very active and I think in part influential with the Sears development, you can see how those are pulled out, re-examined, and that public process, I, I think, personally, is rather effective because it does have an impact on what eventually will be approved by zoning. What actually gets built, if you look at the work session that we gave, um, there's detailed information that's online about that where we talked about and gave an example of previously approved developments, and I think we did it in the Tyson's area, as to which ones actually have been constructed and the duration of time with that. It just provides additional insight that I think is really beneficial. I should have paid more attention to the rules. Is the team for the all of us together? We're going to have one sec. One sec. Up to Carol. No. Okay, I'll, I'll be very brief. Part of that question was, do we have the ability to, to reject a, a development project? The answer is no. Do we have the ability to influence, potentially? I hope so. 
Uh, I will tell you, I, I think that uh, Supervisor Gross, when she gets here, will tell you that we've had a historic number of meetings with supervisors over the last couple of years. And I, I will tell you, Sandy Evans champions uh, for this, this district uh, and does that so, so well with Penny Gross and others. Um, but we cannot be an afterthought in terms of the planning, right? We've got to be front and center when these decisions are being made, and our only ability to do that is have you all help us keep that issue at the forefront because it's all about influencing the process. We don't have official authority. Thank you. Um, okay, some of the, one of these questions is waiting for when um, Supervisor Gross gets here, but so I do think we spoke to this, but number six, can or is the Fairfax County School Board looking at revising the student yield formula more accurately to project the number of students um, expected in a district? For example, this district apparently is um, totally different than others, right? Every district's different. Um, unless, I heard AJ is good at this kind of stuff. Oh, AJ's very good. You got your mic over there, AJ? Well, I heard you're a yeah, numbers guy. It's like, no, Jeff, you can have it. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the point about this is, and AJ's done a great job of briefing me. In fact, the actual student yield formula is 11.7 now. And as of December of 2014, uh, we requested an increase. Now, that's fine. But the point of it is to show that it, in fact, does incrementally increase. Is it adequate? No. But that opportunity shows that there is receptivity. When we get information about the impact of potential development, the county staff works really well with the school staff to identify what the impact is. So we calculate what we believe the yield ratios are. Now again, at that work session that we provided recently to the school board, we not only talked about, as I said, the proffer of the student yield. The percent of accuracy we talked about in those elements was pretty darn accurate. Now we weren't as accurate as we'd like to be in single uh, family homes, single dwelling units, what we call them. But we were amazingly accurate in multi-family multi dwelling units. I, I suggest that you review that and take a look at that because we will be talking with the county to update our yield. One of the unique factors that have been talked about in this region is, well, that's great when you do it initially. But when we look at the uh, recycling of developments that we've all experienced about, in fact, as planning departments, we look at our kindergarten birth rates, and then we looked at the actual tenants. And in certain communities, that difference five years later about the number of students that are attending our schools in those regions reflects home sales of young families moving in with multiple children. And the impact of that in some regions is a higher percentage, and we have to factor that in. So the point. In certain regions, we're seeing that over time, certain type of dwelling units have, in, in some cases, a potential greater impact. Now, there's a difference. It gets down into how high the high rise, what the initial price points were, where the price points are. There's a number of complexities, but that's part and parcel of the reason why we were asked the staff and that correspondence to re-engage re the Infrastructure Finance Committee is to go ahead and discuss all of that. Because in the past, here before, that element hasn't been a component. And it's one of the things Ms. Evans has been pushing, and Ms. Reed has, and the school board as a whole, for us to look at that and to get to that level of granularity. Because not only is the concern about the dollar amount, but the concern is about the timing of when the impact truly will be fully saturated. You've got the bell. OK, I'm sorry. Sandy, OK. And th this is a discussion that we're going to have to continue to have. I think what uh, the school board sees, uh, what I've seen is the disconnect between the student yield ratio and what we see in actuality. The Sears and the Wilson situation is a good example of that. With 589 units in Wilson, the student yield ratio was projected to be 179 our actual there currently is 391 more than double so we see that disconnect and say how can that be it doesn't reflect reality well and there are explanations for it the student yield ratio doesn't take into account aging aging housing units. it doesn't take into account when the economy tanks and people double and triple up 
So, um, but I want this conversation to continue. I think my colleagues on the board do as well to make sure that whatever we are doing, that we reflect reality in terms of what we get in terms of proffers, because that's the reality that as a school system, we have to deal with not just the number of students who come in the door the first day. Okay, thank you. Uh, we just want to make sure we keep going because we want the audience to get their chance to talk and ask questions. So um, we do have just one other question and then we'll save the others for when Supervisor Rose gets here. Um, when does the school, do we say that? Where am I? Um, do, 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 what's the final one? When does the school board weigh in on deciding? We did that. Am I? <coughs> yeah. Uh, did we say who decides where the school goes? No, they said they do. Okay, yeah, we're done. We're finished, right? Okay, um, now I will, yeah, we'll go ahead and ask this. When um, Mason District Council has an online petition with over 500 signatures in support of the school board's request uh, to return the Wilson site to as a school, uh, we went a step further and asked for the Fairfax County School Board, uh, board of Supervisors just to give you back the property. Um, and so we do, we had 300 signatures in 72, in 24 hours. And so if you don't have, if you want to sign up on that, you can still sign it at MaceDistrict.org. But um, what's the question follow up here? What can we do to make sure you get this? What, what can we do to, the community has spoken several times. In fact, if my thing was up, we would show you that several requests since 2012, um, there's been community requests, numbers of requests for it. How can the, what else can we do to get this to be used as a school with all the stuff coming and, you know, over to you. Well, first of all, I want to thank the Mason District Council for taking the lead on that and, and uh, for everybody who did sign the petition. This is a conversation that we continue to have with the Board of Supervisors. As many of you know, um, we have had discussions with the county about regaining that site and using it for a school or for some kind of classroom space. We, uh, the board um, put itself on the in January of 2013 as requesting that site back to use for a school site. It hasn't happened yet, but uh, we have had, a, um, we had a, a Dr. Garza and I, uh, and perhaps Dr. Garza would like to, to add to this as well, but we had a meeting in early December at which we discussed this, and we, we are having continuing conversations about whether the school system can either regain that site for a, a school or whether we could do some sort of a, um, whether we could combine. We talk a lot on the board, on our joint boards, about true community schools. A true community school where we have classroom space and also surrounding services, health services, for example. Uh, we've never been able to truly do that, but um, I would be hopeful that we could work with the, the county board and get something uh, going on that. Dr. Rosa, do you want to add to that at all? Or? Um, since, I, since I've been here, I know full well that uh, Jeff Plattenberg and his team have worked very closely with the county team, and there have been many conversations about the Wilson property. Um, leading up to the fact that we thought we had to go another direction to solve the challenges at Bailey's, because it was, in our view, uh, a, a crisis situation, and we needed to think creatively. I give a lot of credit to our uh, facility team and Jeff and, and I think that was a creative and um, um, fast response, and I think it was a beautiful school. We're very proud of Bailey's Upper Elementary School. We thank the community for supporting us. But there have been many, many, many conversations. Yes, it was a formal conversation, but there were a number of other conversations where we felt like um, we just needed you all to know that we've had those conversations. There have actually been a formal meeting, uh, but it's been multiple conversations behind the scenes. Is there still opportunity? I believe there is. Uh, I think you could ask Supervisor Gross when she uh, gets here. I think there's still an opportunity. I think she's hearing from the community. I think you're making you're having a making a difference in the conversation because I've sensed that the conversation is changing somewhat. And I think there is an opportunity to do something new and innovative that not only serves children and but also serves families with wraparound services. So I think it could be an innovative, another opportunity to do something unique and innovative if, if we you know, can work together and do something really special. Thank you. Okay, at this time, I want to open the floor to audience participation. 
Um, Debbie will man the mic over there. If you want to um, be prepared to ask a question, you may come up to one of the mics on either side of the room and ask your question. If you have a specific school, um, a county person to address, make sure you ask that person. Um, and if you're too shy, I have Sarah walking around with a basket and little cards, and Amanda is going to help do that. If you're too shy, you can put your question on a card. Make sure you write legibly and indicate who you're asking. I do recommend, though, that everybody, we like it our forums to have people get up and talk. Right now, I'm going to turn it over to Jill Barris, the president of Glasgow PTA. Let's give her a warm welcome for her volunteerism. And we'll do it Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for being here with us tonight. My name is Jill Barris, and I have a sixth grade student here at Glasgow Middle School and a ninth grade student at, um, at Jeb Stewart. Um, Dr. Garza, thank you for bringing up the innovative program for level one English learners that's proposed for Stewart next year, and I'm looking forward to learning more about that. But tonight I want to inquire about the Fairfax Leadership Academy. Um, on Monday, the Washington Post published a column by Jane Matthews supporting the implementation of the academy. This academy would serve approximately 400 middle and high school students in the Stewart pyramid and would focus on the significant educational needs of this community's most struggling and average students, including those ESL students. The Academy would also help to alleviate significant overcrowding at both Glasgow and Stewart, and would address student needs across a broad spectrum. I'm encouraged to see these kinds of innovative solutions being put into practice. And I'm very curious about when and if FCPS will support uh, Fairfax Leadership Academy as it is supporting the uh, Academy that you referenced earlier. Um, I'm, I'm happy to address that. I'm actually, Eric Welch is somewhere in the room, um, and Eric, I give him, there he is, a lot of credit uh, to his uh, insight, his passion uh, for students, uh, and I think Sean uh, DeRose has also been very involved in that. Uh, right now, we are not in a position to open uh, Fairfax Leadership uh, Academy. Is there an opportunity down the road? Maybe so. Uh, keep in mind, we've had almost a half a half a billion dollars out of our operating budget. Uh, we've cut almost 2,200 positions in the system. So our ability to be innovative is somewhat limited, and we have to focus what limited dollars we have to do that around areas that are our most critical need. Next year, we're saying we're going to open an innovative school within the school model at Stewart High School and Lee High School we hope we're in a position to implement that and expand it further in some other high schools, middle schools where we have need. And so right now, that's our priority. We've asked um, for Eric and Sean to help us. This gives them an opportunity to also uh, put some of their ideas uh, in action, and, and we can see where we go from there. Uh, we certainly want to take advantage of that passion uh, and dedication that they have for, for our children and this community. And, and a school that's a standalone school would not be a solution to overcrowding because you cannot make students go to uh, um, essentially a school without attendance boundaries. So we think that's not necessarily, we want to have a full, full portfolio of school options because we think we need more options for kids versus less. But that would also not uh, respond necessarily in a long-term uh, way, respond to the uh, the challenges we have. Okay, no follow up, or are you good for that? Okay, um, I'm going to open the mic on this side, Susie. And we just want you to say your name and your neighborhood, and if you have kids um, in what school you're in. Here you go. Susie Wells, and I have a son here at Glasgow. And <coughs> I realize land is scarce in this part of the county and vertical schools may become more prevalent. When will the county develop criteria which defines an urban school, such as the appropriate size, play space, acreage, etc., as needed for an urban school? The current FCPS education specification discusses this for traditional schools, but is silent on vertical or urban schools. 
Well, I can address that. I mean, our current process is we develop educational specifications, and those educational specifications address the instructional program. Whether the instructional program is in a non-vertical school or a vertical school, the instructional program still has to be met. And that's based upon the curriculum. So the curriculum standards, the curriculum specialists identify what the programs are that we are going to accommodate. So any vertical school that we have has to meet the instructional criteria that we offer. Now, um, in terms of um, providing anything further than that, there, there heretofore hasn't been a way to discern, okay, well, what is the difference between uh, a two-story middle school and a middle school that is just on one level? So short of uh, not going into that level of granularity, because we do have middle schools that are of different size and shape, we do have elementary schools of different size and shape, and we do have high school and secondary schools of different size and shape. So the curriculum and the instructional program is really the form that drives the function. When I was looking in the latest um, the education spec, there's a section in there on play fields and paved play accesses. There's a section in there on the gym, the size of the gym. There's a section in there on special characteristics for the, and how big the paved area should be, 10,000 square feet. Kindergarten paved area, 2,000 square feet. Soccer field, the size. So it, it, it does lay it out in the education spec. And that has not been discussed. I've heard m mention of a mo the Tyson's model, which is different from the Bailey's upper model, which is different from the discussion of putting an elementary school on Columbia Pike, which is a two-acre lot. I've seen emails where we don't want to go smaller than five acres, but we already have with Bailey's, and now it's, what's the right size, and how do you accommodate? I think that would be worth documenting if the county has knows they're going to urban schools, they should think about what's the minimum they'd be willing to accept instead of keep changing that as we get the situation becomes more dire. Yeah, the situation is evolving and it is it is dire and the numbers are outrageous and they're not producing land. So your comments are more we'll, we'll receive. Okay, next. Um, we're going to do a couple of these folks who come up. We prefer you come up. Put it that way. Um, this is like the least line we've ever had at our forums, okay? I'm gonna let, you know, you all are shy, I guess. But yeah, usually we have people lined up. Okay, next, name, neighborhood, and school. All right. All right, Jeffrey Long, 
um, hopefully we can come up with a plan that works for everyone. Thank you, Nicole. Are there schools on board of the property now? Are there schools on board of the you mean county board? There are on county owned property? There are a number of different property, uh, you know, the evolution of the history of Fairfax County, there's a number of different parcels where it has been county-owned property that we have schools on, okay? So when you look at all the different land bays and the land site and the different acquisitions that we've got over time, we have a number of different, in fact, even if we were to ever get rid of any property, we have to go back through the county to see if there's any desire for the county to have it. It is semantics, absolutely, it's up to let us do it. Okay, follow up, Mr. Longo. Yeah, this is actually for the audience. Just a 10 second plea that um, if we don't currently have a supervisor that has number one priority for the schools, we need someone that does. The deadline for filing that application is June. <laughs> so well, I think Supervisor Gross will be here shortly and she can answer uh, some of this herself. I do agree with Ms. Evans, and I do think there's reason for optimism. I will tell you, anything like this where we talk and we control and we, uh, you know, uh, have scheduled appointments and really talk about the challenges we have as a system, that's one thing. But then to hear the voices of the community, and I, my, in my view, your voices have made a difference. I've seen a change even in the last six months or even last couple of months or so, a change in the uh, receptivity, I guess, uh, of that concept. And so I think you all are making a difference. I think your message is being received and heard, and I'm, I'm optimistic that we can find a solution. So don't let up, but keep it up. Uh, but, I, but I do think you're, you're uh, making a difference. Okay, great. John? Speak in the mic for me, please. I don't want to spend too much time on Wilson, but uh, if that discussion has salient points on the county side for not getting it back to the school system, it might be helpful to know what they are uh, so that uh, we either political pressure or social pressure can be applied for the, to resolve it. Uh, presumably, they have their priorities, whatever they are, not necessarily school. But we need to know what they are before we can judge whether that the debate. Discussion is not progress. Yeah. And apparently it hasn't been progress for quite a while. Yeah. It's probably a little bit unfair for us to try to speak for um, the county until um, Mrs. Gross is here. That, you know, if, if we could hold that question right. until she gets here. I know um, uh, uh, Supervisor Gross told me that this is their uh, county board day, and so she had other meetings, but she was going to get here just as soon as she came. I think she was going to try to be here at, by 8 o'clock, so um, if you could hold that question until she's here. Then we can... okay. My question, though, is uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned earlier about the uh, $11,700 per student per year. Uh, that is presumably not what it actually costs the school to, to either teach a student and supply a student and or build the facilities for the students. Do we have any numbers for what those target values or amounts are? Yeah, that's the whole purpose of re-engaging this conversation. I mean, when we talk about it, um, even though it's incremental, the methodology is what really uh, dilutes the amount in that profit component. We just want to go ahead and continue furthering that conversation, that dialogue, to make sure that we're all singing off the same sheet of music. And to the other conversation that we we're having, you know, we are all in this together. Conversations are being held. There, as Dr. Burns has said, receptivity. Some of the creative solutions that we've, we've heard are about being community services as well as education. Um, maybe I'm just optimistic, but we haven't had those type of conversations. Thank you. Okay, lady. Say, oh, sorry. I was going to give this number. Dr. Garza has this number in her head. Thirteen thousand four hundred seventy-one dollars is. Oh, here. <laughs> dollar off. Dollar off. Uh, so, six of your citizens guide. Which I hope you'll uh, pick up the, uh, the budget guide as well. So, that's what it is to educate. That's the average cost of educating a child. And that's just for a year. And that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't include 
adding a seed, <coughs> adding capacity to a soil, it just doesn't. So, no, those properties don't come close. Thank you. Okay, who has been, you've been standing here a while. Do you, are you wanting to ask a question? I'm Elaine Beaver. I have a child in Jack Stewart School and now is coming next year. I have a few questions. Uh, first, I have a wish, and um, my wish is um, that um, uh, I think that the lessons in, uh, I don't know, in America or this uh, county or it's Virginia are too long. If we have put 85 minutes to 7 minute uh, bathroom break, it's unacceptable. I'm really horrified how they, anybody can do this. Children can do this and teachers can do this. This really surprised me because if we adults get all together, sit down for 85 minutes and have seven minutes break, come back, sit down another 85 minutes, and this is what we want, four or five times, and it's every day. I mean, what a pressure we have on children. There's stress level and everything. I think it's too much. Uh, and from, from their development, their brain is not developed. And I'm wondering if uh, county would like to go and look at this, how how to work on this issue and see if we can uh, decrease the amount of time for for them to sit in time uh, and <laughs> increase their uh, rate. And uh, with this in mind, uh, uh, Jeff Stewart, according to Washington Post, uh, within four years, got 400 extra students. We are having another 100 next year. I have a question uh, which is immediate, and I'm wondering if it's possible to research A, to have an afternoon classes or evening classes. I know high school students want, uh, and they like working, maybe they want to work in the morning and then kind of come to school in the afternoon and have evening classes. Uh, this is my first question. So we can decrease the amount of students in the daytime because we will offer them extra uh, time. Uh, the second question is, is it possible for students, of course on the recommendation of the, of the teachers, to have online classes? So maybe they can stay home and work online once a day and then they will not come to school and it will be a, a relief for the bathrooms and cafeterias and all that stuff. And we can schedule maybe an online day where they can go to a different place. Okay, let's let them ask uh, answers. That. Okay, there are some long questions there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Yes, a couple of questions, a very interesting questions, and I think you and I have already discussed some of them. The first one is that for next year, we are definitely in conjunction with the principal, Jay and Terry, we are trying to organize the schedule. Now that the, the, the start time is going to be a little bit different uh, for all the high schools, uh, we're going to try to reorganize the instructional time a little bit differently but the, than what we have. Uh, we see that uh, the passing time is an issue, and we want to figure out it in terms of how can we provide the, the, the instructional time that we need to provide to our kids, while at the same time maybe reorganize the passing time from one class to the other. And there is a space to do that, there is room to do that to improve uh, uh, the schedule. So yes, we are looking into that, and we are going to act on it. I, I think, Elaine, you're actually um there's a larger question here, and something about the, you know dealing with the future of education. One of the things that we need to be thinking about and looking at is what education will look like in the future, and not be so tied to seat time, not be so tied to X number of minutes in a seat, and then seven minutes between classes. Tell, uh, telelearning, we're doing some work. Uh, Thomas Jefferson has some telelearning days now. I'd love to see that expanded to other schools as well. We want to do more project-based learning, which means that students would be more on their own following their passions. And we want to get to that point as a school system where we can do some of that innovative work, get away from seat time, more into project-based learning and critical thinking. So I think your the, the point you raised goes beyond just the current seven-minute past time to a larger question that we really need to grapple with because education is going to look very different a decade from now. I could go on and on about this topic. Um, and and Ms. Evans did, I think, a really a great job of capturing. Right now, we currently have a one-size-fits-all model for education of our children, particularly at the high school level, for the for our state. And we've advocated uh, with our delegation in Richmond, look at our legislative program if you're interested, 
uh, we, we've got to have more options for students for them to, to be, be in a position to uh, study and, and align their path in high school around their uh, areas of interest uh, moving forward. Um, overall health and wellness, I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to look at the pressure we put on students. Um, and I'm, there's, some, I think, some creative things that we can do better as a system and still keep our students competitive for the major universities that everyone in this area wants to go to. Uh, so we're really looking at that moving forward. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to really be innovative and uh, be a, a leader across the Commonwealth in helping think differently about education. And there's a lot of things that Ms. Evans talked about. I will say for next year, what we're contemplating with this particular school within the school model for, for our students uh, that are learning English that we anticipate that will be a staggered, flexible schedule, for example. But there's much more of that ahead. Thank you. Okay, I do want to just mention that we are going till 9 o'clock for those you fidgeters out there. And um, also want to recognize Supervisor Gross, who has just come in. Welcome. And um, one more follow-up question, and then we have to go to the other folks. <coughs> I was volunteering in, in two um, uh, community centers, a Mason District and in the um, Leaf Community Center on Anato Road, and I know they have uh, rooms available. Perhaps is it possible to take children to English One, for example, for a day, just stay there and do intense English so they can get English faster on the faster space, and then they can go back and do other subjects? So we can uh, intensify their English because they really need to do just English from nine, let's say, till two. It's just another opportunity. Maybe you want to research, and it's, I don't know if it's a question if you, anybody can answer. I think you have some good ideas over there. Uh, on this model that we're looking at, is very uh, literacy language intensive, and that means students would take the full array of courses that a traditional student would take. Uh, in order for them to learn the language and grasp the language well. So it's a very different instructional model. We're looking at um, a successful programs all across the country to see what we can take and learn from and make better uh, than maybe some other uh, 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 schools across the country. I know that uh, Dr. Zalaga and others have visited some of those programs. Okay, Debbie, somebody over the Oh, sorry. Just to clarify with the, our language uh, program that we're trying to implement next year, there's the those are, those are ideas, no, those are ideas that we definitely will take into consideration. We have a great group working on it, and uh, our main goal is to see how we can accelerate, as Dr. Garci just explained a few minutes ago, how we can accelerate the language learning of the, for those students. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to Okay, my name is Amy King, and I live within the um, Beach Street community, but my daughter attends Belvedere third grade. First question is about your school within the school. I think it's a great idea. Are you going to expand it to the grade schools? Because here's the problem. First, kindergarten, first, second, third. I mean, I, I, I subbed as a long-term sub in fifth grade to help with getting literacy for fifth graders up is shockingly low. And it, it is, it's, it's not due to teachers failing, it's due to the influx of children who come in. My daughter in second grade had five children in her class who did not speak English and none of them spoke the same language. It's ridiculous to not think that does not impact the education of kids who speak English. So integration to the point that it's impacting all of our children negatively is bad. If we can teach, if we can do, we'll put the school within a school in grade school, we're not going to have this problem in high school. That's my question. Well, we, the reason we're looking at the high schools first is we have to start somewhere, and that's where our greatest need is right now. Uh, at the elementary level, uh, they, our data suggests that as long as they come into our elementary schools and we have enough time, that we actually are able to get them back on, on grade level. But with that said, as we explore these other models across the country, we are looking at and open to new instructional designs that would even affect elementary uh, classrooms. But we just have to start somewhere. Uh, are we interested and open to new and different ideas at the elementary level? Absolutely. 
but we just have to start somewhere. And so we're starting with the, the high schools first. And uh, several of us here on this panel tonight did look at different models. We went to uh, Texas and looked at several different different models. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Zuluaga was there, uh, Ms. Darnett Koufax, Ms. Pearson was there. Um, we looked at, and they were at all different levels. We looked at high school. There were some that were at the middle school level, and there were some at the elementary school level. That was also the school within the school. So that's something that, that we reviewed and we can continue to review. And one of the um, markers of these programs, I believe all of the programs that, that we witnessed, were that it was it was for a limited time. It was for either one or two years, and then the student was was then put into the day school with very intensive, very intensive language. Some of it was double blocking language, double blocking math. Some of it, um, we looked at one high school which had a very long day. We looked at a high school that what had both uh, uh, classes during the day and a full uh, load at night for people who work during the day and then they would come and have a, a, a full number of hours. It wasn't just a couple of hours, it was, it was a full evening. Um, so we have looked at different models and I think we can continue to explore this. Okay, I have a follow-up too. So, in other words, this, this cluster that we're calling, we're still calling ourselves a cluster, is so overcrowded and we all already know that. With the numbers we're seeing that are going into development, and we said, we, we very delicate, with the tie, very delicately said that we have two and three people living per family in some of these dwellings. Are we accounting for that at all in our development? Because, I mean, that really is a big problem here. We, we have people who have, are living three families to an apartment that's really one, that's meant for one family. We're not, we're not collecting tax money on that and we're not actually getting an accurate number for how many kids are going to come into our school district. So how are, how are we planning for that is my question. Well, what, I, what I can say about how we're planning for that is, you raise a good point, how, how can you control for um, multi-families living in one alone? The reality is when students register, that's when we realize it. it's behind the scenes. But again, that's why having an annual review, a uh, five-year projection, really starts to tease out those areas where we might be experiencing that. And that's that's really the current way that we have it because there's no forecast when families, multiple families move into one dwelling unless they have to the registration process. Thank you. Okay, next. Uh, who's next? Sarah. Hi, right. Sarah Gertie. I have one at Bradford Elementary, one coming up. I have one that already went through. I graduated to Ada and Dale from well, just graduated from college. But my question actually stems off her first question, actually the same question I had. But having seen one go through and times have changed. And I can say from where my time was here in the Mason District for the school, is there was a separate school in the school then, back in my day. And I think there should be one in the elementary level, because I'll say as a parent, I actually see that there are many kids in the classes, even in the kindergarten age, and I think you're kind of expecting my child to help teach yeah. the other child English. And yeah. so my child, I feel like, is being penalized because he's being held back to try to not be taught as much. And I've noticed teachers have to stop doing their work to focus on the one child in the class. So I think you really do need to start the school to school at the kindergarten level. And I think that's where your your most time is spent. You don't get those kids at kindergarten learning their how to read and write and spell, and you're going to lose them. So what can we do to get it started, not just in the high school level, get it started sooner in the elementary level? Okay, you speak to some of the challenges that our elementary teachers face, right? They get a classroom full of students, and the students are all over the continuum. I will not, having been an elementary teacher, elementary principal, I get those challenges are, are great, particularly as our student population continues to change. That brings uh, different challenges uh, moving forward. I think something we've got to figure out, and that is we need to be serving every qualifying children, every qualifying child, and a high quality uh, preschool program. 
and we're not right now, we're serving only about 54% of the qualifying students. Ask any kindergarten teacher, they can tell you the first day of school, who has been, which child has been in a high quality preschool environment. That's where the achievement gap starts, right there. Our elementary principals that are in I think, can, can attest to this. We have got to figure this out. Only 54% of the qualifying students. Um, and that goes specifically for children in poverty and children that are English language learners. We've got to catch them as early as possible. As we look at these new configurations, we're also talking about how can we start services to some of these children even when they come, like during the summer. Don't wait for school to start. Is there some way we can capture them and start to serve them even in the summer uh, while, we, while we wait to get school off and running? That gives them a jump start uh, also. So we're looking at a lot of those different models. Well, the follow-up to that real quick is that some of these kids aren't they're coming and starting going to school for the first time in their entire life ever in fourth grade. And so they're coming from a place that they've never actually sat in a class, and now you're asking them to sit down in a class and not speak English and expect a teacher to teach that child while trying to teach the rest of the class. And it really is a disruption, especially when they show up in the middle of November or December, and then they've never sat in a classroom ever in their entire life. So. Thank you. Um, Debbie's got someone in her mind. Hi, my name is Kim Cook. I'm the executive director of the Vietnamese Resettlement Association. And we have been very lucky that after you gave back the, the Wilson School to the county, that we have been able to have our office along with many other community organizations at the Wilson Center to serve the community all over Fairfax County and especially the Seven Quarter um, <clears throat> and the Wilson area communities. I have been a clinical social worker uh, for, <clears throat> and I started out in 1970, 70, um, and in 75, when so many refugees and immigrants came to this county, they were so welcome. And many of them have done very well in this county, thanks to the school in many ways. Many of our children are now um, doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers, social workers, and very much a part of America. And I hope that all of the, that this county continue to serve um, our children the same way because the amount that they will give back is unbelievable. If you look on the directory, most of the doctors that serve the underserved people in this area are Asians or Middle Eastern. Anyway, my office, my, the Vietnamese Resettlement Association, we serve both in health and welfare, uh, social services and health care for people that have no insurance, that are low income, and most of the time don't speak English very well to deal with the whole bureaucracy of the area. Thank you. Thank and, you for your service. Um, I just want to say that we would love to keep Wilson as a school for the neighborhood and keep the quality of the neighborhood the way it is. And don't forget, there are a lot of low income, disabled, and elderly people that depend on this neighborhood to, to serve them and to maintain them, um, to keep their quality of life the way we all enjoy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, in the room knows that we are start starting something very exciting at Falls Church High School this fall. For the first time, we are going to have Vietnamese language in Fairfax County um, at Falls Church High School. We're starting with level one this fall, and then we're going to go to level two, three, and four. And so I'm very excited about that. Um, I just want to mention that I think the 
<clears throat> the diverse community either did not have the knowledge how to participate and how to contribute to the school and the county or has not been asked. But the talent in these community are tremendous. People don't come here not speaking English. Doesn't mean they don't have a talent. They didn't have a profession before and they could not contribute. Those are the parents that could help the children and help the school. Thank you. Yeah, I think everybody agrees with what you're saying. And I think one of the problems is that um, it's this influx of so many people right now that can't speak English that is stressing the social systems, at least the schools. So I think everybody here embraces diversity, but I do hear a sense that because there's so many folks that don't speak English at, at, um, that came in at one time or coming in, that's what part of the issue is right now. And that's why we're all here. Uh, Ernie? I'm Ernie Wells, and uh, I live in City Hall Manor, and I have a son at Glasgow. Uh, we moved here in 1998, and uh, not to curry favor, but as a voter in local elections, I've only pulled the lever for Sandy and her predecessor and Supervisor Gross. So, uh, Thank you. I, <laughs> I've generally supported all the bond referendums on the ballot for paying for services that, and I'm willing to contribute to those services that make for a good community like good schools and infrastructure, parks and libraries. As a general rule, we as citizens don't have the time to become an expert on every issue and decision, land use, schools, bonds that the county makes, uh, decisions that the county makes in our area. And, and a general level of trust is essential to getting those things done in the county. And I would say that for me, and, and I would say, speaking for a number of my neighbors I've spoken to, that, that level of trust has eroded over the last few years based on our recent experiences with the county decision-making processes. And whether it was the 2012 bond re referendum, school bond referendum, and specifically what that would be used for, or the Bailey's Upper School Site selection and the lack of communication with the neighborhood, the local adjacent neighborhoods ahead of time so that they understood what was happening, and we were very involved in that. Uh, and the lack of full transparency in the county's plans for the old Wilson School. If it's not uh, intended to be used for school, what does the county have and plan for it, as other people have said today? So I would address this question to Sandy and Dr. Garsha and to Supervisor Gross. Do you recognize a problem with the level of community trust? And what can each of you do to help rebuild the community trust in the way you do business and the way you do business for the community? Um, as we go back over the Bailey's upper situation, all of us regret that um, as we were speeding through that, that we didn't do a better job with the, the neighbors such as yourself. We did go out to the Bailey's, the Bailey's parents as really, I think just as soon as possible. I remember that summer when we were looking at that site and I was saying, we've got to get out to those parents and talk to them about having the first vertical school and whether that's acceptable to them. We should have at that same time gone to the surrounding neighbors and we didn't. I think we apologized for that quite a few times. But this whole process has made me realize that when it comes to facilities, when it comes to the CIP, for example, and this, this document that you see is just a part of our, our CIP, we have not done as good a job as a school board, as a school system, to go out and talk to the community. It's not that we don't put it out there. We, we put the CIP out there in December. We have a, a, a hearing at the beginning of January, and then the school board votes on the CIP at the end of January. We do, what we, we do that out in the open. What we haven't done in the past, and what I brought up with our public engagement committee and with uh, other members of the board, is we need to do a better job of actually going out to each and every school, each and every community, and say, look at page 42. That applies to you. And let's have a conversation about that if we need to. It's different to just put it out there in the public view. It's a different thing to actually go to the school and kind of shake people by the shoulders and say, look at this, because we, you know, this is something that's important to you. And I think as a school board, as a school system, we need to have more of that in the future. And, and I am pursuing that. Uh, Thank you, Carol. Um, as uh, Ms. Evans acknowledged, the Bailey situation was unique, and, and um, it was unfortunate. I know that people felt like that was quick, but we felt compelled to do something that was that was, you know, 
that was were responding to a very significant uh, need. And, and also we were trying to acquire property, and much of that has to be uh, kept confidential by, by law. But we could have done better. We've acknowledged that, and certainly uh, we've, we've talked about that in the, in the public. We have this year, for the first time ever, we've had a discussion with our school board on a monthly basis around facilities. We want to develop a different way to plan and look strategically at our capital plan. And if you go back and look, in previous years, there was typically one, maybe two work sessions on uh, capital planning. This year, we've had one every month. We've also recognized we've got to do better on community engagement. And we've been working with FPAC. Uh, you will see over, starting in March, we're going to be taking this out to various communities. And we're going to be starting with uh, Mount Vernon Pyramid, um, uh, West Potomac Pyramid. And we'll be going all throughout the community to talk about these difficult but challenge, difficult and challenging uh, decisions we have ahead and we need for our community to be engaged and supportive moving forward. So you've, we've heard you, you're right, uh, we're committed to doing better and I think you'll see evidence of that in the coming months and we'll be working with our FPAC committee to make sure that we're listening and responding to the community. And one thing which is that our public engagement committee uh, just uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, uh, we are going to recommend to the school board that we start having regional meetings about the, the CIP and about facilities issues in which we will actually go out to the community and actively engage. And that's as a direct result of, of uh, the concerns that we have, which, which mirror your own earnings. So thank you. If I may. Is it on? Okay. If I may. First of all, Ernie, thank you for your votes over the years. I appreciate that. Um, land use is hard, and it's often very messy. And it really doesn't matter whether it's about a school or about a commercial development, um, an industrial park, um, a new series of residential homes. It gets messy. Uh, I see our planning commissioner here. I'm sure you can uh, agree. It, it sometimes gets messy. Um, but the comprehensive plan uh, process, rezoning, special exceptions, and the proper condition amendment that is coming up on the Bailey's Upper Elementary School um, is a very public process. It is a public process by law and also by the individual supervisors, um, some of whom have land use committees and other things, and some of whom don't. I happen to have a land use committee. Um, you asked uh, what the county's pro uh, plan for Wilston is. Wilston has been the Wilston Multicultural Center for, I think, since 1985 or so. So it's been a location for a lot of services for the community for many years. And I will tell you that over the last 20 years, I've had, I've lost count of the number of people who developers have come to me wanting to redevelop that property. They want to get rid of the Wilson site and put up housing or put up more commercial. And I've said, no, unless you can re replicate all of the um, space, including the field that serves the community, you're not going to get to do that. So we are still maintaining it as the Wilston Multicultural Center. It has been discussed and it is part of the Seven Corners Wilston Comprehensive Plan uh, Visioning Task Force recommendations. Um, more recently, we are having interesting conversations with the superintendent and with Sandy Evans and with the chairman um, of the board and the county staff about what kind of collaborative win-win situation we might be able to have at Wilston that would answer both the uh, county needs and some of the school needs. We're at the beginning of those conversations. A lot of that conversation has been generated by requests from the community about the site. And I, I think it'll take some time yet to figure out exactly how that will, will work. But we are ex exploring, having some interesting ex and exploring some uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, maintaining the services as Kim Cook, thank you for all the years that, of service that you've been doing there. Uh, maintaining those services is very, very important and at the moment we don't have another location for them. So that's where we are right now. Can I follow up one quick one then? When I, you know, Molly earlier, Supervisor Chris, you weren't here, but you know, we've talked about all the development that's going on 
in all sorts of areas of Mason District in terms of new residential development in our area. Uh, it has been unable to kind of keep up with the capacity issues we have today. It's been a problem, and Mr. Plattenberg said that, you know, that we're not getting new land. There's not a lot of op real options that are out there that are obvious to people. And when I think about adding all this extra density in the midst of not just one overcrowded school, but a sea of overcrowded schools in our area, I, I have to say I get a little proclaimed. Uh, uh, and so what can you tell me, what can you tell us that I'm missing in this equation that would make me feel better in my mind about adding this extra residential density in our already overcrowded schools and we don't have obvious solutions. So I'm just, I mean, what is it I'm missing yeah. that allows this and makes me, to make me sleep better at night? Well, first of all, I thought my Fairfax County educated daughter was the only one per other person I've ever heard use the word for plant. <laughs> I'm impressed. Um, And I think up on the on the screen, you see a number of um, items that are checked off and others that are not. Um, most of the ones that are the larger ones, the uh, Bailey's Crossroads um, plan and the um, and the work that we're doing on Seven Corners. Remember, those are are predicated on a 40-year planning horizon. That. And, and quite frankly, we did the Bailey's plan about seven years ago, six years ago, and none of that has been built yet. So um, it is a very long-term plan. Uh, some of the smaller uh, groups, the smaller things that would have been done, the, um, uh, oh, there's Rosalind Auto Body, that was actually planned for and approved in 1999, I believe. So we were using all of the, all they went through all the processes that we had and used the same kinds of um, work with the school system. Um, so I, I would say, yes, there are, Mason District has become popular once again. You know, for a very long time, nobody was investing in Mason District. That's not the case anymore. People are investing in Mason District. People are out of building new homes, they're buying new homes, that's a good thing. Trying to manage the growth is the challenge that we have. And so I think that from the standpoint of when you see a lot of zeros up there, remember, that's on a 40-year planning horizon. In most cases, it hasn't happened because there are long-term leases for the commercial properties that will not that preclude any development of the property until those leases are gone. That's just a little more insight into the planning process and also the land use process in Fairfax County. I was saying my concern wasn't just the planning though, it was about I see buildings going up, like on, uh, yeah. you know, in some places all over the Mason District too. Some of these buildings are going up, not just the Sears property, but there are extra density filling in right now that I'm worried about just today, much less what might come in the Well, let me, let me add, if I may, because I thought I saw up there, um, let's see, not Cherry Street, it was the other one, um, Arlington Boulevard. Uh, where they're doing high rises, that was actually uh, approved in about 1977 and never built. And under the laws of Virginia, once it is zoned, you have the right to develop under the zoning. If you want to do something else, you have to come forward for a change. But once it is zoned, you have the right to develop it, even if it was zoned decades ago. That's Virginia state law. Thank you. Yeah, I think the thing for the parents, though, we see all this coming in, and we already know we're at capacity at the schools, and basically the, the schools, the social system of the schools is, is, is having a problem with it. Next, you've been waiting the longest you win the award. Uh, I'm Ginger Hayes. I'm the president of the Stork PTSA. Uh, I, Dr. Barza, you mentioned that the state of Virginia is, treats everyone as a cookie cutter, one size fits all approach. Um, Historically, Fairfax County uh, recently has been treating most of the schools in our district very much the same way. So I thank you for recognizing that putting something in play at Stewart uh, as a pilot program to test it, looking at it's not as a cookie cutter with the rest of the high schools in the community. What I do challenge, however, is looking, challenge all of you on our school system and on our school board to look at that because you're talking about putting in something in place to help a small group of people at one end of the spectrum. We also have an IV program in place that helps people at the other end of the spectrum. And in between, we have over 1,600 other children who don't fall into either one of those two categories. 
and there is a lot of concern about what are the resources that are going to be going to and how are they going to be treated in the classroom environment. You mentioned a couple of hundred people. The senior class outgoing at Stewart this year is 350 students. The incoming freshman class next year is well over 500. So you're not looking at a one-to-one -one ratio. So all of these issues combining on top of how we're going to continue to make sure that the bulk of the student population is served. What kinds of programs can we look at putting in place that's going to make sure that it's across the spectrum that all of the students' academic needs are served? There's a lot of things I could talk about with regard to, I mean, you bring up a very good point, and that, that is we own and we're responsible for the needs of every child and meeting the needs of every child. I will contend that when we have uh, unique populations of students that require intensive support, that we have to provide that intensive support so that the needs of all, all the other students throughout the system, throughout the school, their needs can be addressed in a meaningful way because otherwise it, it pulls those resources away from uh, the ser serving all children. So I will contend if we do this well, and I'm convinced we will next year, I think it will help all children, although it's being designed for a unique population of students, I think it will help relieve some of the strain on all of our classes, on all of our programming uh, there at Stewart and Lee High School, and I think will be a model for us to put in other high schools across uh, our school system. But there are lots of things that we're doing around instruction, classroom instruction, literacy, writing across the curriculum that we believe is very important for all children. And so I know we don't have enough time to talk about those right now, uh, but I, I've been very impressed. We've uh, mobilized additional resources to Stewart High School, and I believe that they're using those very effectively. And I think the support that's being provided by these gentlemen that were mentioned earlier, um, I think is having a very uh, positive impact. I think there's evidence to, to demonstrate that. Debbie, uh, uh, you I would just add that. to, I think uh, Fabio wants to say something as well. I don't know if, uh, if Jay and Terry want to add, but I would say that there's nothing uh, quite like having a great teacher. And, you know, we have some, some great teachers in this, in this room. And that's key to making sure that every child gets what he or she needs. We are uh, in Mason District, uh, we, we are blessed that we have uh, lower class sizes here, and that helps us as well, because we do have needs-based staffing now at all different levels. So that's important as well, and uh, that's important for us to maintain. Just another, ex there are lots of areas, I can, directions I can take this, but I think one that I think you'll see will make an inordinate amount of uh, difference, significant difference this year, is we've changed the staffing process. Down the road, we'd like to have a differentiated compensation model so that we can keep our best teachers uh, in our schools where we need our best teachers. And in many cases, they're commuting long distances. But one thing we are doing is we're front-loading schools like Stewart High School and, and some of these schools that you're talking about so that they have a jump start on the hiring process. Uh, in the past, if you asked our principals, they were not in a position to hire teachers until sometimes June or July. Uh, they'll be in a position this year, in some cases, to start hiring in April, and all schools will be in a position to start hiring uh, May 1. So we can get a jump start on some of these surrounding school systems so that we can hire some of the best teachers uh, and, and keep them uh, very early on. That's just one example of some ways that we're hearing from principals, we help them a lot, uh, get the staff that they need to really make a difference for our students. Thank you for mentioning that because that has been an issue in the past. We're losing our best teachers to those surrounding school districts. Right, just very briefly also, um, just to mention that, for example, at Stewart High School, we were able to develop a completely different model to teach mathematics. Uh, I'm very proud of the model that we developed this year, especially to uh, uh, motivate and engage the students in algebra, Algebra two, algebra one, algebra two, geometry. We're also as I, I want the community to know is that part of what makes this community so wonderful is the diversity. The first thing with Dr. Garza, when she mentioned to me, uh, Fabio, I want you to move to Region Two. I want you to uh, help us in Region Two. I immediately realized what a great opportunity, and it's really very humbling for me as a bird. I am a new immigrant. What a great opportunity to really be in a community 
uh, where all of us working together will figure out a way to really meet the needs of all of our students. Just a brief example. I have seen all the way in, in, in our schools here in Region 2, grades K through 12, examples of fantastic teachers who really have the tools, they really understand how to differentiate instruction to meet the needs of our very beginning kids, the kids who are in the middle, and our very advanced students. And just because they, they actually suggested, they gave us this, this idea very briefly, is that, hey Fabio, we need more tools in terms of really how to teach literacy to meet the needs of our diverse student population. As a result of that, we're going to bring close to 1,700 teachers this summer to really work with them in terms of how do you reach kids at different levels in reading, write, and, in reading and writing. So we're very excited. This is something that is, is being done in many other school divisions in the United States. So we're excited we're going to have this opportunity to do it here in Fairfax. Too. Thank you. Debbie, we're going to read some. Now I just want to make note of the time. It's almost 9 o'clock. So we're going to get everybody standing if you will be patient with us. And then, then we have some written questions. Ginger, did you have one more thing? Yeah, I, this is uh, for Kenny Gross. Uh, in our community, Mason District, you mentioned that we have become popular again. And I think that's a great statement because I am challenging you and the rest of our elected officials here to realize that education is the tail that wags the dog. If we don't have a high education system, if we don't have a quality education system, we don't have the property values, we don't have the tax base, none of this is happening. There's no reason for people to come. Yeah. Yeah. They're closely in trying to make, and our superintendent in trying to make these changes happen so we can continue to support what has made Mason District popular. Again. Thank you, Ginger. If I could respond, you know, uh, public education, an excellent public education, is the number one priority of the county board of supervisors. It has been reestablished, uh, re reaffirmed many times. Um, 50, about 52 to 53 percent of the entire county budget goes to the schools. We just take that money and transfer it to the schools. Now, I have always supported the budget, including the school budget that comes to the Board of Supervisors. Don't let anybody tell you that they support schools if they don't vote for the county budget. If you don't vote for the budget, you don't support schools. And most of us do support schools, and, that, and we do that by transferring a good part of our, of your tax dollars to our public schools to do exactly as Ginger said, and that's keep our our school system up right up here. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. I'm going to read some of the questions from the audience. We've only had Bailey Upper open since September, and already it's at capacity, along with regular Bailey schools. Where will you put the overflow when this happens in another year? Most additions and upgrades are overcrowded within two to three years. Well, that's a good question, but Bailey's actually upper is not overcrowded, and it, it, the actual enrollment came a little bit lower this year than was anticipated. But, you know, those, the question period is an important one that we have to look at throughout this whole region, and that's why we review it annually and revise our CFP process. It's, we're making that document more user-friendly with our friends' help, and, and we're, we're committed to continuing to do that to make it more uh, transparent and conversant about what actually is occurring. Okay, one more red question, Debbie. Read. Um, I'd say a um, question about the strategy at Stewart's principal. How long do we pay for additional high um, price mentors for the principal rather than putting that money towards the children or paying for schools to alleviate the overcrowding situation and bringing someone in who's experienced with this type of community? Um, the principal at Stewart High School has my full support, as I know the people at this table. Uh, as many other circumstances throughout the division where we have, our schools are so unique. We have 196 different schools, and none of them are exactly the same. And there will be occasions where we need to mobilize additional support to schools for a multitude of different reasons. That is our responsibility, and we will continue to do that. I'm seeing evidence of wonderful progress, uh, and I think there's really good things ahead for student high school. Thank you, okay, and we're gonna take two more from Debbie, but we did have a question um, that we asked you all before, and um, one was, um, 
for, uh, I guess it's the Board of Supervisors and the school board, are you going to ask for federal funding to help with the, the school costs? Is that something that you're doing? Federal funding for the um, large amount of folks that we're getting here. Oh yes, actually, uh, we we just uh, dealt with that the other day. As a matter of fact, and our chair is here. We uh, I believe what we decided was that we would have a letter from the chair, uh, and so uh, that will be going out. Uh, Dr. Burns, did you know what they? Uh, yeah. Can you give us some background on that? Well, we could, um, the one thing that I'm also doing is I'm reaching out directly to our legislators here in Virginia. Um, I'm setting up meetings um, with um, uh, our new congressman, Byer. Um, we're also meeting with, we're trying to set the meeting also with Dr. Moni Chin, who's at the uh, Board of Education. We're talking about what you're all telling us and what we're seeing. I represent the Lee District. I'm the chair, but I represent the Lee District. And so but the Lee um, High School is very similar in uh, population to what you're seeing at Stewart. And so I understand your challenges very, very much. I'm also a parent in that, in that area, so I have children in, in the schools over there. The um, letter is not quite finished, but the direction from the board was basically to say, you know, um, we want to meet every child at, 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 at their level. Um, there, as you mentioned, the, the numbers are great this year. They, um, and we want to be sure that we can, you know, these children came to our country because they want to be successful. And if we know that education is the key to their greater success, we have to be able to meet them at their level. And the challenges that they bring with them, um, you know, some of them are, I just had a meeting today with the principal um, at Lee High School, and some of the ones we're seeing, the numbers have tripled since last year in, in, in that area, the numbers that she's seen, and in some ways they're pre-level one, which means they have little numeracy, little literacy in their own language, very little English skills. So we're talking challenges that we haven't seen before, and we're well aware of what we need to bring to them, and we really, truly want their success. And that's so thank you. Focus in on that. Thank you. Um, Debbie, do you want to ask any more for the audience or do you want to let Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Carson. I, I can tell you very quickly, the letter does include, and if, if you want more information on this, I was going to give a plea at the end to make sure you go look at all of our budget information because that time is um, now. Um, the, that process is starting in earnest and we'll need your support moving forward. But uh, we've had an experience this year, a 22% increase in the number of level one students and those are students just learning English. And what does that translate into? About a $4.1 million increase in our budget for next year. So it does translate into real um, increased cost. We are responsible and we're happy and, and uh, feel a moral obligation to respond to every child's needs. But we, do, we are asking for the federal government to step up and help us uh, as we've experienced this unique phenomenon and growth uh, in this area. I, I think the Board of Supervisors would be happy to support that kind of uh, request. But make sure that it doesn't, that any federal funding that you might get on that doesn't supplant existing funding that we get. It does no good to take it from one pocket and put it in the other pocket because then there is no extra money. This is extra money that we'd be going after. Okay, let me go ahead. Do you want to read it or do you want to let this later? Let's let you go. Hi, I'm Jane Cheek. I live in Bel Air. I have a fourth grader at Belvedere and a seventh grader in Glasgow. And I also really enjoy being a substitute teacher. So I'm real familiar with a lot of the issues we've talked about. I'm also the parent of a special needs child. And I just really want to make sure we remember that it's not just the numbers. It's about these unique populations. Diversity is not just language. It's making sure that the facilities can really accommodate kids who have every potential in the world, but they need specialized learning and behavioral support systems. It can't be taking tests in the hallways or in closets. And separation is just not always the answer. So just <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Joan Daly, and um, I'm a former parent of three Fairfax County students. They've all graduated. 
And um, I'm from the Falls Church Pyramid. I'm just curious, is anybody here from the Falls Church Pyramid tonight? One person? Two? Okay, well, we are a crazy district. Um, and so I'm here tonight because I wanted to um, bring attention to, um, this is actually a question for Supervisor Gross, about the um, inadequate funding for the capital improvement um, projects in the schools. Falls Church High School has not been fully renovated since it was built in the 60s. It's the oldest high school in the county. It's one of five legacy high schools, meaning the five older ones that have not been fully renovated. And it's had a really negative effect on the community that I live in. And we now have multiple generations of students who've gone through the school and it hasn't been fully renovated. And as a result, some of the uh, facilities create what I would call um, unequal learning environments, especially in the science and technology departments. And um, this can cause students to, and parents who are able, um, to exercise their freedom of choice and people place their kids out of the school. So we keep running up to the same problem. This, um, many of the people at this table here, Sandy and Mr. Plattenberg, have worked really well and hard for us to try to keep this um, issue uh, to get attention. But we keep running up to the same obstacle. And that obstacle is we don't have enough funding to take care of the schools that are old and need to be renovated. What are we going to do? Well, let me see if I can address that. First of all, um, Falls Church High School is now in Mason District. Until 2011, it was in the Providence District, so I could always just push them off to Linda Smith and to you, Patty. Um, although more than half the kids um, who go, I'm sorry, more than half of the students who attend Falls Church High School do live in Mason District. Um, you're talking about the, um, the, the bonding capacity. Um, and I will say, when, when I first got Falls Church into my district, Sandy and I went over and met with the principal. We took a tour, because I had seen the bathrooms there at a meeting one time, and it was just awful. I won't say it was gross, it was disgusting, because it's never gross, but it really was disgusting. And uh, we actually got some work done there uh, to uh, upgrade those bathrooms. But um, when I first got on the board, the uh, bonding capacity was split about 50-50 between the county and the schools. And then a few years later, we actually increased that, and now it's at the uh, schools get two-thirds of the bonding capacity, and the county facilities get one-third. So it's about, uh, but it's about $155 million every school bond. Um, in order to keep our AAA bond rating, and it is very fragile right now, we have to be very careful about our um, bonding capacity. And so I know that the schools have asked for, uh, we, I heard from at least one school board member, not Sandy, uh, who wanted all of the county's bonding capacity for schools. We can't do that, quite frankly, because that would put at risk police stations, fire stations, libraries, and county facilities. So we can't do that. But we have looked at, at some creative ways, and that's why the infrastructure, what we call infrastructure finance committees, um, uh, with school board and, and board of supervisors, that's why the committee was put together, to look at ways of saving money. We're looking at how can you renovate a school at less cost? Um, the business community seems to have some techniques. We don't know, you know, why can't those be uh, implemented in the school system. Jeff, I'm stepping on your <laughs> on, on your area. But we do have these conversations. But again, good financial practices mean you don't put all of your money in one location. We really have to be careful about our bonding capacity. And we also need to follow what the school system puts in FCIP. That's what we adopt for a bond, uh, is what the school system has asked for. Thank you. OK. Um, I'm sorry, I just feel compelled to make this. Oh, Excuse me, I'll briefly say it. We have the lowest cost per square foot, not only in the locality, in the region, and also in the nation. If you look at that, and the lowest square foot per child, I'm not really proud of that factor, but what that really means in terms of public educational facilities, our team in the history of Fairfax County Public Schools and the renovation and construction program is a national model, and it is a standard of best practice which is reflected in your um, budget manual, the uh, Constituents Guide to Budget Practice. Please pick up a copy of that and review it. If you've got any questions, don't hesitate to ask me. Sorry. 
Thank you. I'm Clyde Miller from uh, Home Fund Valley Citizens Association. No, no question this is a difficult problem, but it's important to ask ourselves how our school system has come to be in such a poor condition. Who is to blame? I believe that we are to blame, the community. We have let this happen to our children and to our property values. Schools are overcrowded and their budgets are inadequate. Wilston, a prime site for a badly needed new school, has been claimed for a $125 million county office building for which there is no demonstrated need. And we are offered in exchange high-rise elementary schools on blacktop in commercial districts that are not suitable for schools. That's nonsense. Just imagine the schools that we could have for the $125 million were invested in children's education instead of being invested in the glory of Mason District. Over the last 34 years, we, the citizens of Fairfax County, have never turned down a school bond referendum. Never. We have given every dollar asked of us. How then can our school system lack for funds? The county needs, the community needs to address the two underlying problems. First, the Board of Supervisors has an insatiable appetite for flooding the county, Mason District in particular, with high density residential development. 8,900 units in Bailey's and up to 6,000 at Seven Corners. That's nonsense. The second, the Board of Supervisors, and second, the Board of Supervisors places too low a priority on the quality of our public schools. They throttle our budget. We, the community, have clear tasks. We, the community, have clear tasks to accomplish: moderate growth, secure and adequate budget for our schools, and take back Wilston. The Board of Supervisors works for us. We are in charge. So our task is, to, so we, we are in charge of the task that we need to accomplish are clear. We need to get to work. We need to make our voices heard. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's not a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, I think that's what Budget. So will you be supporting the full request of FCPS this year? And how can we get other supervisors to do so to fully fund FCPS? First of all, we don't have our budget yet. The school board has, has adopted their budget, uh, put, it, uh, put, put it forward, but we don't get the budget 
from the county executive until our meeting on the 17th. So I, I know you're going to say, oh, she's trying to duck it. But quite frankly, I don't know what's going to be the recommendation of the county executive for the budget. We'll find out, we'll all find out on the 17th. Um, and then we will have our negotiated negotiations with uh, each member of the board, with the school board, and with all the other folks who are coming to us wanting something from the county budget. So um, if you could just bear with us, we don't know yet. And quite frankly, that's absolutely the truth. The county executive does not share his budget until he presents it to us on Channel 16 the morning of our board meeting. He does not give us any information. So we get to be surprised just like everybody else. Thank you. Carol? Oh, okay. Well, Ginger went already. I was going to thank Jessica well, for that I, question and say I, I do hope that, that those of you in the room will support our school budget. We have done a great, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Garza and her team have done a great job of putting it together with a great deal of work, and I do hope that, that everyone here will, will support fully funding that budget. Two more questions, then we're going to finish for the night. Yes. Sure. Uh, Carol Turner, and Ravenwood Park, and it just, it seems crazy to me because Wilson is sitting on county land. The schools are county. What, what's the difference? Besides that, we're, we're also begging for money from the board. So if we just give the, the land back to the school, which we're all county, there's no, there's, it's crazy. As I told you before, land use is hard and it gets messy. But, but, but uh, let, me, um, uh, let me tell you, Carol, there is no option for a school in the comprehensive plan for the Wilson site. Well, maybe the comprehensive plan would have to be. Would have to be <laughs> wait a second. Wait a second. This is what we've been working on for the last two and a half years with all the series. The well, that sucks. With the seven quarters. The that committee was, did not say man. what should go there. That was not part of yeah. their their. Uh, not done, Carol. I know, but but done. don't say it's yeah. not in there. Current comprehensive plan does not allow an option for a school on the Wilson site. Then change it. Yeah, that's what we're working on right now. Thank you. There's no school in the plan. Thank you. Next question. Oh, oh, oh sorry, Dr. Garza. May I just say on? A, I thank you, Miss Evans, for making me a deal on the budget. I could speak all evening just on the budget, <laughs> but I just ask you. I know I can't talk about it tonight for time. But I implore you, please uh, read these materials and the talking points on the budget. If you care about our schools today, tomorrow, into the future, we need your voice in this process. And so please, please stand with us as we make some really difficult decisions moving ahead. We've got to keep our schools strong. And then finally, if people had questions that tonight that they did not get to ask, we stand ready to, to answer those wherever they are, if you'll just get them to us. We'll provide a written uh, written response because I know the time uh, time has gotten away from us. But if someone has questions that he can answer, we're happy to. Thanks, because I know we did have some written questions that we did not get to. Ms. The uh, uh, a question was asked just before um, Ms. Gross got here this evening that was shelved until she got here so that she could have the opportunity to respond by um, Ms. King. And since we've been here talking about overcapacity and, and overcrowding in the schools, that being one of the main focuses here. She was commenting on the multiple families living in single family dwellings and the zoning and housing ordinances and enforcement of those ordinances. And the question that was shelved to wait for you to be able to get her to respond to that. So what is there a plan? Is there a way that the county uh, board of supervisors is dealing with that particular issue that's happening so frequently here in the Mason district area? In 2007, the Board of Supervisors created something we called the strike team to go after multiple occupancy. Uh, that worked quite well. In fact, it worked well enough that we, de we decided to create an entire department, the Department of Code Compliance. The Department of Code Compliance operates on a complaint basis, and you can turn in the suspected uh, multiple occupancy for investigation. We need the street address, the exact street address, and what you suspect. 
internet into my office, or you can call the Department of Code Compliance directly at 703-324-1300, and they will uh, endeavor to investigate it. However, remember that under the Fourth Amendment, you do not have to allow any member, anybody in the government to come into your home. So people do have the right to say no, but we also have the ability to uh, address a number of multiple occupancy issues, and we have done that. It continues, but we have done that. Uh, if it, if it, uh, in most cases, we don't have to take people to court. In most cases, they will um, come into compliance voluntarily. There are some that don't, and we continue to work on that. Okay, so I have a quick follow-up question to you about that. You said that we don't find out until we see multiple addresses come in on students, that there are multiple people living in dwellings. Can the schools report that? Because we don't, I don't live in a, an apartment building. I don't know how many people live in the apartment buildings. So can the schools start addressing that? Because that, that's taxpayer money that we need to pay for this. Um, just as a uh, as school receives um, registration forms and things of that nature, we aren't in the um, business of figuring out how many, how large the place is and things of that nature, so that would never be on the school, on the school side. Okay, so the task force that was started in 2007 needs to be re-upped because it's a big problem we're still having. Um, let me just say well, but, that we have survey results that show that people have no, um, no faith in code compliance. If you want to see the data, it's on our website, masondistrict.org. People stop calling. So um, I don't really personally want to hear a lecture on code compliance. John, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Penny. Um, I would like to follow up um, on the remarks that you said. I'd like to begin the way you usually begin with my remarks, that that is a lot of misinformation. As we both know, as everybody here knows, Co-compliance is a complete sham. It's been a sham for years. That strike force was a sham. It doesn't do what it's supposed to. Six billion dollars has left the county in, since you've gotten here, largely because of code enforcement. It has a lot to do with the fact that our police force is understaffed by like 200. Um, the uh, the neighborhoods are falling down. The schools are falling down. That's happened on your watch. Okay. okay. Final word, Penny. You want to have one final say? Thank you. Else want to say? Okay, we want to thank you all for coming this evening, and um, we really do care about this district, and that's why we hold these forums, so we appreciate you coming out and supporting our community.